They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields, the whole cruel fate of slaves. This scripture comes from Exodus 1 verse 14. Hello, my name is Sandra Timko and welcome brothers and sisters to a new segment of Lumen Christi that will be heart-wrenching as well as educating. As always, thank you for joining us as we together examine the truth and try to increase the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. After hearing the scripture, you're probably wondering who in the world is subject today to bitter, harsh labor in the fields, working with bricks and mortar. Well, my friends, a whole civilization, men, women, and children, babies, no concern for age or health, are all slaves, demeaned, demoralized by the barbarian landlords of the kilns. It's absolutely unbelievable that this is happening daily. Is there anyone helping to save these broken people, God's people, from a life of inhumane treatment? Well, yes. The Lord has raised up an army whose ministry is to rescue. Rescue Christians is the only ministry that rescues people from Islamic persecution in the Far East, the Middle East, Africa, Pakistan, Syria, Iraq, Somalia, and Yemen. Their efforts have saved around 6,000 people so far. Today we have with us Keith Davies, Executive Director of Forum for the Middle East, Understanding and Rescue Christians. It's truly a privilege and honor to introduce you, my brothers and sisters, to a true hero in the army of God. Thank you, Keith, for coming. Thank you for having me. God bless you. Before we even begin our time together, you brought a new promotional video that kind of sums up what you're all about. So just give us a little prelude and we're going to run it. Well, this is our main program that we're running at the moment. We do other programs. This program has been the most successful and it's uh, our attempt to save the uh, Christians who are enslaved in Pakistan in the kilns. So uh, we just got this actual video literally a few minutes ago and uh, I passed it over to your producer and uh, we're, we're going to show it, I think. Okay, Stacy, if you're ready. ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਸਜ਼ਾ ਦੇਂਦੇ ਹੋ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਸਜ਼ਾ ਉਹ ਇਹ ਦਿ
मिशन को अपने मसीही लोगों की बनाई के लिए काम करते रहेंगे अपने लोगों की को रेस्क्यू करते रहेंगे वाओ दैट वाज सो अमेजिंग नाउ वी हैड अ लॉट ऑफ टाइम टुगेदर लास्ट नाइट स्पीकिंग अबाउट दिस एंटायर मिनिस्ट्री एंड आई थॉट इट वाइजेस्ट इफ यू टेल अस फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल हाउ यू वर इंस्पायर्ड टू बिगिन But I also want you to tell us why this is fulfilling prophecy. Well, we only started this five years ago. However, we've been doing. We started a charity uh, back in two thousand and six. We actually started work in two thousand and three. I met a man by the name of Walid Shubat, and Walid Shubat was a former Palestinian terrorist uh, who wanted to kill Jews and was a himself admitted self anti Semite. Uh, planted a bomb right in a in a bank. Um, Uh, actually, was a ringleader in riots, throw stones from the we- Western Wall, um, and and back in 1994, his wife, uh, he wanted to convert his his Catholic wife, to become uh, Muslim. So she uh, she said to him, she was a smart lady, and she says to him, "You told me that the Jews corrupted the Bible and the Christians corrupted the New Testament. Show me the corruptions in the Bible, and I will, if that's, show me this stuff and show me that they corrupted. I'll become Muslim." So while he went off and he bought a Bible for for ten dollars, and he's probably now one of the greatest Bible scholars in the world, and he's written many books, and and his primary book is God's War on Terror, which we which is a bestseller, and we sold like seventy five thousand copies of that book, and it really lays out. In fact, a lot of the stuff that's in that book, which he wrote several years ago, is now coming to fruition. We're seeing right in front of our eyes what's happening. I met Walid back in 2003. I heard him on a radio show on the internet. I happened to be listening, and I looked him up on the internet. I sent him an email. I found an email address. Sent him an email, and he contacted me back. We exchanged. Uh, uh, we talked to each other, and uh, I said, "Your voice needs to be heard by the world." And I uh, and I basically went out and started working the phones and be, uh, and became an expert in PR. I wasn't an expert when I started. But uh, I learned as I went along, and we reached hundreds of millions of people. Walid's been on Fox News, on CNN, on the BBC, on uh, Irish television, television in Chile, television in South Africa, Australia, right, all over the world. His, his message has gone. I think we've probably reached about two billion, if you, uh, on basically on media ratings. And mm, he, he became more, we'll say, extreme. He's not extreme, but. When the message of truth comes out, mm-hmm. it tends it's to be extreme, extreme. Mm-hmm. and most of the media today are now scared of our message. Although we get our message out now through the internet, um, through blog, our blog now gets by between 100 and 200 thousand pages a day, and is growing rapidly. And that's as he helped us to to raise the money. What we do in rescuing Christians now, um, about five years ago, we he'd been speaking out, and about five years ago, we had some contacts that came to us. Um, that had a, a case of blasphemy in Pakistan, where they falsely accused Christians of uh, taking the Prophet's name in vain or saying something negative about, about the Quran. And so this person was um, persecuted. They were trying to arrest him, and he needed a hiding place. He needed to be evacuated out of the country. So at that time, in back 2009, we had we weren't involved in this work. So we started to call all the different organizations out there that we thought were actually helping. Like Voice of the Martyrs, Open Doors, and there's a whole bunch of the Barnabas. We call them all, and to our shock, not one of them had any interest in doing any rescue work. They wanted to give out Bibles, they wanted to uh, give toothbrushes, blankets, um, you know, leadership training, praying, everything but rescue, mm-hmm. right? You know, me, me being Jewish, 
and, uh, and my family, uh, uh, many of my wife's relatives were murdered. I happen to be lucky, as you hear my accent, I'm from Ireland, so the Germans didn't get to Ireland, but they had all our names. So I, I was very aware of the Holocaust and what was going on. You know, I study history, and we'll maybe get into that a little later. Mm -hmm. um, so I said to Waleed, I said, well, if they're not doing anything, then we need to do something. So that's, we started, we helped this, this family. And, uh, and then we met uh, a person through, through another contact of a very reliable NGO. And, and that's another issue is, is dealing with reliable people yes, on the ground. Gonna, but this was a very reliable people mm -hmm. person. And we tested him and we gave him more money and we tested him again. And he, we've now worked with him for five years and he has helped us. Or he, he is the hero, not me. I just raise the money and make people aware. He's the real hero, the, the team leader in Pakistan. He's the guy that's saving the money. We can't give you his name for his protection, right? Um, and we can't even mention any of the names that are people doing the work on the ground because they would be at risk. Because we know that Pakistan uh, intelligence services watch us very carefully. And our website's now being barred in White Pakistan. If you live in Pakistan, you cannot see uh, our websites, shubat.com and rescuechristians.org, are barred. Because, uh, you know, it's funny. The uh, slavery is actually illegal in Pakistan. The actual, what the kiln, wor kiln owners do is actually illegal. However, because of corruption and the politics, and they're able to buy off the politicians, they're able to get away what they're doing uh, because of that. Uh, so why would the ISI be so concerned about us giving Pakistan a bad name? They're giving it to themselves. And you had mentioned last night, and before we get into that portion of this conversation, mm -hmm. I, I found it most interesting that you made mention of how this is so prophetic because of the area that that's taking place in. So if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. What you mean by the biblical side yes, of things, yes, what you mentioned at yes. the start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, I mean, if you look, go back mm -hmm. to the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the book of Exodus, uh, the children of Israel were ca held a captive, mm -hmm. right, building bricks in the cities of Pith and the mountains, bricks, the rigor, uh, um, and they were making the bricks out of straw. This is exactly what these people do. In the video, you saw these bricks, yes. right, and they're making them by hand, just the same way as the Hebrews made bricks by hand, right, at the time of the Egyptians, right, back, uh, what, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Now, you said, and I think it's important, and if you take the time, which we hope you will, to go to the website, you'll be privy to watching many videos of testimonies of people that have been rescued by rescue Christians, but some of their stories are just, they're just mind-blowing, they're heart-wrenching. I'd like you to share with us the process. These um, uneducated, impoverished people that have generally two needs, either health issues or needing a dowry for someone to marry in their family. They have no money, so they go to Right. What happens is uh, these people live, uh, the, the Christian community in Pakistan as a whole is much poorer than the actual Muslim community. And the Muslim community is poor too. You know, it's a poor country. Mm -hmm. But what happens is these, these families, uh, there's a sickness in the family. Somebody has got cancer or some bad illness. And there's no insurance like we have here. And there's no coverage. And the, the government hospitals uh, for a disease like cancer or something is basically a death sentence. You're not going to get the proper treatment. Mm -hmm. So they, they know that the only way that they can save the life of their loved one is to get private care, which costs a lot of money, but nowhere near a cost in America. It's maybe two or $3,000. Here, the same operation would cost fifty, sixty thousand. 60000 you know, in terms of what you have the insurance coverage. And so they, they, they ha don't have no choice but to borrow the money and sell themselves into slavery. The same if they want to get their, their children, their, their daughters married, it's a, it's a big custom that, that you have to provide a dowry. And they don't have the money for the dowry for the, for the daughter, so they want to get her married off well. So they get the dowry and they get the, the married off and they sell themselves again into, into servitude, bondage. Uh, and then, then that's when the problem starts because they can never pay the loan off because they get paid, not only do they get paid very small amounts of money, but the uh, kiln owner basically takes all the interest out and charges probably thousands of percent interest rates, which are usurious, right? So they can, and then they have no money, so they've got to borrow more money just to pay for food to, uh, for their own, to, just to survive. So then the debt gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and they never can get out of, uh, out of debt. And they don't, because they don't read or write, they don't understand they're being ripped off, right? And so what we do is pastors visit these, these kilns. They go there, 
and they minister to these people because they're not allowed to leave because they're afraid if they leave they won't come back so they keep them restricted there. you'll see from the videos that they, right. they state this right and um, so they minister them then the pastors come to us because we're very well known in Pakistan I'm not personally but our organization is very well known in in amongst the Christian community so the pastors go come to us and they tell us this case this case then we send our people out there secretly meet with them and, and, and stealthily meet with them find out make sure that it's a genuine case and then we rescue them and we have a back back a back um, we have a, uh, what's the word, back uh, date, dated. We've got about 450 cases that we have now that we're trying to save, and that's going to take us at least two to three months to fulfill. But by the time we're getting those two to three months fulfilling those 450 rescues, we'll probably have another five or 600 uh, ba back as well that, w that we'll be picking up over the next few months. Before we go even deeper into this conversation, in case you're just tuning in, we are speaking with Keith Davies. He is the founder of rescue Christians that is doing just mind-blowing work in the Far East. He's explaining to us how these people become enslaved in the first place and how you stealthily go about the process of rescuing them. But before you get further into that, again, you, you said last night that these, um, the terrorists and the, um, the people that are running these, these kilns are all in cahoots and many times it's with the government or police so you have to be very very careful with who you take in your fold to help the Correct. process along. Now you said there are 15 people on the ground that are helping remove these people and their life is constantly in danger. Tell us a little bit about what happened recently with someone actually losing their life. Uh, well they didn't know one lost their life. Uh, we were able, they were able to escape but what happened was um, what we do is in the middle of the night uh, we usually arrange to meet them at a certain place so they get up in the middle of the night they leave everything just the clothes on their back and they come to the car where we meet them but one of the boys uh, of the of the uh, of the slave the slave boys who were rescuing and the family didn't come together he came right and then what happened was uh, the kiln owners guards happened to be out having a, a cigarette or or whatever and they they, they saw this and they came up and they said, what's going on here? And then they, they, they suspected they were trying to, to, to save these people. And they took them in and they started to beat them and, and uh, torture them. And, but they always denied they were doing anything because if they admitted, they probably would have been killed. And the boy is also was tortured as well. And so they, were, they st stole their identity uh, cards and their cell phones. And, uh, and that's no big deal. We were able to replace them pretty, pretty easily. Um, th then they, these people are so uh, courageous, they, within two or three days they're back again and they actually saved the family. So th they ignored the, 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 the threat. They actually went back to the same kill and saved these people. Now you, you had me so intrigued last night and people that are watching are probably wondering, well how does that process happen? How is this connection made that lets you know that this particular family is ready to be moved out? Where, where do all these um, exchanges happen? Is this done by phone? How, is, how do you make the connections? Well, the, initially, I was explaining the, the, past, the pastors visit these places. Right, you mentioned right, that. And then they tell us about the cases and where they are. Right, and so then we go and we have a secret meeting with them, or we f we were able to call them or whatever, and then we find out, and then we actually ar arrange a time and a place, and we pick them up, and we and uh, we use all different types of uh, different cars that are that, that can't be traced, and all sorts of stuff. We have very innovative ways, which I'm not going to tell people right, right. here, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure my Pakistani uh, uh, secret service will be like to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we we get we get a, a police officer who's sympathetic. Uh, to the cause, you know, and we give them like twenty dollars, the equivalent in, in rupees. And um, by the way, a thousand rupees, uh, uh, one dollar is a hundred rupees. So if anyone you see the videos when they mention the word rupee, multiply by a hundred or divided by a hundred to get the number of dollars. And uh, so we give him, and he would go in and arrest the family, right? But uh, pr like trump up a charge that they did something wrong, and then they would pass the family over to us, and we would take them away. No. That's where I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, well, where do you take these people? Okay, well, what we do is we, we don't believe in giving people the fish. We, get, we believe in giving them the fishing rod. Mm -hmm. And what we do, uh, before we rescue anybody, we already have a job lined up. Um, we also provide the rent for the first month and the deposit. 
We provide them for the first couple of weeks some food, some pots and pans and bedding. And then when we release them, we put, place them in their new home, they already have the job, and off they're off to the races and their life is restored. And they have a real job that they can actually earn enough money to pay for food and rent and whatever. You know, like, like they go from literally abject poverty to lower middle class. What does it cost you to save one family? Between five and six hundred dollars. That's astounding because I'm sure in a year's time people spend that much on renting videos, you know. Right. So you can save a family. Correct. And you can provide them a new step forward in a new life. Five hundred and twenty dollars is what it's costing us now. That's because of the volume we were, we were able to buy. Because we, remember, we buy food in bulk and we buy bedding in bulk now. Like when we started, we were buying one or two beds. We were buying food for for one family. Now, when we go out, we buy food for one hundred, two hundred families. So we're able to buy everything a little cheaper, which brings the cost down even more. Now, there is just so much more that needs to be explained about Rescue Christians. And we invite you and I urge you to watch the next two segments that Lumen Christie is producing for this ministry uh, to help expose the good works they're doing. And we hope that you're moved to help. Uh, we only have four minutes. Now, t to wind this down, I'd like you to um, further along a website, any phone numbers if someone wants to talk to you directly, um, if they're interested in having you speak, could you share that with us? Sure. Well, first of all, let me explain. The, the slavery part of our, of our work is really an introduction to the issue of persecution. We do lots of other work as well. In fact, some of the work that we do, we can't even publicize because it's so dangerous for the people that are doing the rescuing, so we can't even say what we're doing, right? So, you know, I'd just like to make a point that, yes, the blasphemy were, or the the work we do with slaves is something that we feel comfortable making public. Right. Right. Some of the stuff we do we can't make public. So I'll just make that point. Right. But even itself, the there's about twenty thousand families, uh, Christian families that are enslaved. We've estimated that it's going to cost us approximately twelve million dollars to free them all, or most of them. We'll never be able to free them all because we'll never pick up every single case. But we're approximately twelve million dollars. Or we have a website. And every single case, every single blas or not blas slave case that we actually save, we take a five to six minute video testimony and they tell us who they are, that they save them, and so forth. We do that for a reason because most people don't watch it, but we do it to prove that, that we're earnest. doing the work. That's right. Right. 90% of the money that's donated to our organization is used for the purpose or held in reserve for future operations. Right. And we have to have a fairly good reserve of money because when an emergency comes up, we can't be begging people for money. We have to have the money to go and do it. Right. So, so when we have that reserve, it's done for a reason. And that five or six hundred dollars to rescue a family, that includes these people that are actually doing the escape. No, they actually are paid more, more but, the, but I just put it in perspective. Um, we have a team of 15 people on the ground. Mm -hmm. It costs our organization wages only thirty two hundred dollars a month. And last month we rescued, in the month of the January, we rescued 100 families, which was 700 people. This month in February, when this program has been recorded, we will save about 150 families, which will be 1,000 people. It, it's astounding. Um, a phone number, an email address? Sure. Our phone you. number, if you'd like to call us, uh, you can donate on, uh, by that way. You can also donate online, but our telephone number, if you'd like to reach me, is 1-877-832-7200. That's 1-877-832-7200. And we also have a website, which is rescuechristians.org. And you can go there, and you can donate online there. We have a, you can also use PayPal, or you can use our regular um, credit card donation button. I, I just want to make mention, when you're watching these videos, we talked about this just momentarily last night, and we only have a couple minutes. Some of these testimonies, the people, again, are extremely uneducated. And they've just come from a terrorized situation. So they are being transformed and um, their life is being made new. So there's lots of trust issues. The yeah. bottom line is <clears throat> when you watch them, um, though heart-wrenching, you'll see that some of the conversation seems a little rigid. And that's simply because they're being helped with grammar. And Correct. Well, what happens is they're very uncomfortable in front of the camera. Yes. They're inarticulate. They don't speak well. Right, and they're very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? And like we do a five or six minute interview, you'll see that, but it sometimes takes us an hour to get that five or six minutes. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not easy, right? But one of the, uh, about 5% of the cases that we do are rape victims, and we actually focus in on prioritizing 
families that, where they have daughters between the ages of 12 and 18, and we know they've been abused. And then when we find out those families are abused in that particular kiln, we also realize that there's other families also being abused, so we get, we get them to help us say which other families have daughters that are also being raped, right? And they give us the names and we get them out as well. So we focus in on those families as top priority to, to say first. Keith, I, I want to thank you for giving thank us you. this 30 minutes and the next hour um, also. And I ask, too, if it would be all right with you that we show your video at the beginning of each of these segments. That's up to you. Yeah, no problem. That would be wonderful. I think it would be uh, self-explanatory, and it, it'll move the heart as well. In closing, Psalm 140, verse 2 and 3 is a prayer for all of us. None can avoid the snares the devil tries to capture us with, but this is a scripture prayer to fight the enemy. Remember, bondage comes in all different forms. It reads, deliver me, Lord, from the wicked. Preserve me from the violent, from those who plan evil in their hearts, who stir up conflicts every day, who sharpen their tongues like serpents, venom of asp on their lips. And as always, remember to let Christ's light shine through you.